gentlemen, welcome to the preliminary round of the 2016 World School Debating Championship. Please turn off all your mobile phones. Thank you. The motion for this round today is that this house believes that, the technolo that technology companies with significant market shares should not be eligible for patent protection. Debating this round are Team South Africa who are proposing as well as Team India who are proposing. <laughs> Speaking for the proposition are first speaker Rebecca, second speaker William and third speaker Stephen. Please welcome. <laughs> Speaking for the opposition are first speaker Karthik. <laughs> Second speaker, Hammond. Uh, and third speaker, Dahan J. <laughs> Judging this debate are Juanslav Petschow from Slovakia, Vincent Löwe from Germany, and Natasha from England. <laughs> Speaking time for these speeches is eight minutes. The first and the last minute are protected from points of information. A knock will be sounded after the first and the seventh minute. There are no points of information during the reply speeches. It's now my pleasure to welcome Rebecca, the first speaker of the proposition, to open the debate. Before the next ask the order and closing team is setting the bus. I think for that. Apple and Google are spending more money on patent acquisition and litigation than they are on research and development. As a proposition, we care about two things in this debate. Firstly, consumer choice, because people are happier when they can choose how to spend their money to meet specific needs. And secondly, we care about fairness within the technology industry, because we can only all benefit from people's good ideas when there are fewer barriers to entry. We believe in these things because we say that the nature of the technology industry is that it is fast becoming the backbone of our society and there is an urgency in making it as accessible as possible. So, we believe that big technology companies, meaning companies involved in technology products such as smartphones, apps, software, and even green technology, should never be in possession of patents. And a patent is a license which, which would allow you to exclude others from working on that product, usually for a period of up to 20 years. All their existing patents will be lifted, and they cannot file for patents, buy them from others, or buy up smaller companies in order to acquire those patents. Obviously, when these big companies come up with ideas, smaller companies wouldn't be allowed to patent them on the grounds that they aren't a novel idea. Similarly, once small companies reach significant market share, they too would have to give up their patents. And this is a policy that would go hand in hand with reforming the patent process, so that only small, active players in the industry are awarded those patents. I'm going to be telling you three things in my debate. Firstly, the principle of patents. Secondly, how the current system stifles innovation of small companies. And, sec and lastly, how we get better competition between Not big patient. and small companies. No. My second speaker, William, will be talking about competition between big companies. But before we get on to the positive matter, let's ask ourselves, why is this debate taking place specifically in the technology industry? And what we tell you here is that there is a systemic failure in over-patenting. The opposition in this debate is going to tell you that this is necessary for innovation protection. Now, in the minority of cases, that might be true, but in the majority of cases, they're doing it for other reasons. The first one is the nature of the industry, where there's no close link between the patent and the product. So in the pharmaceutical the industry, education. you might have one patent for one molecule of a product, whereas your average smartphone holds 250,000 patents. Moreover, the second idea here is that they're patenting because they don't want to be excluded. They know that there is a competitive race to the bottom because if they don't <coughs> patent it, someone else will. But thirdly, these companies have the resources and teams of lawyers whose job it is to patent things. They're patenting multiple minuscule aspects of a product, which means we create patent figures. Let's get on to the first point, which is the principle of patents. We believe that patents exist solely for a utilitarian function to protect and incentivize innovation, not as some abstract protection of ideas. The reason we don't give you full claim to your ideas is because they're arbitrary. They're based on things like your education and your experiences. Who, uh, 
comes up with these ideas and when is often inevitable and arbitrary as well. But moreover, ideas are not a finite resource. So regardless of who the owner is, anyone can benefit from it. We think that this is intuitively evidenced by the patent process, where we place a time limit on the patent, where we don't just give patents to anyone for any idea. We expect you to show that you can turn it into a product. So at the point where we undermine the function of patents, we wouldn't allow them. I'm now going to do a comparative between big companies and small companies to show you why the big ones don't need these patents. Point? Yes. What is the link between market share and the number of patents a company holds? So we think that bigger companies that have larger market share tend to patent things more for the reasons I've already explained within my context, because there's this competitive race to the bottom, because they have teams of lawyers whose job it is to do so. In my speech, I'm going to be telling you why that's something that's harmful. If we look at these big companies, they already have first mover advantage, which means that they can benefit from their ideas while other people still have to catch up. They are allowed to practice co economies of scale, which means that they have teams of researchers who can streamline the patent process and can churn up many ideas at a very small cost. But moreover, they have integrated product networks, which means that not only are consumers already locked into the brand, such as having an iPhone and an iWatch, but they can use these pre-existing product sets to launch their new innovations off of them. For example, when Apple launched Apple Music within their new iPhone, what this tells us is that they can still profit from their ideas regardless of whether they hold those patents. But moreover, we'd say that an incentive already exists to boards, shareholders, and a captive audience where they have an existing performance to defend. On the comparative, though, we'd say that small companies have much higher risk. All they have is their ideas. The owners often face personal financial risk, which means that they need to be protected to make that risk worth it. They have very little capital, which means even marginal costs like innovation cost a lot higher. And there's a risk that the ideas can be stolen before they develop. So what we say here is that big companies would thrive under either system. But let's get on to the second point of positive matter, which is why the current system stifles innovation. We've told you why the patent thicket is inevitable. <coughs> and this creates specific barriers to entry. The first one is that there's this legal obstacle. Understanding and interpreting the patent thicket is often very difficult when new products have to be tested to check whether they violate any existing patent laws. Small companies are discouraged from innovating because they fear litigation, when 90% of cases are settled and can cost between two and five million dollars. But secondly, the patent thicket means that they can only develop around this thicket. There exist two broad types of patents. The first are your broader, vague ones, which often overlap. And then you get your micro, minuscule patents, such as Apple patenting their various screws within their products. All of this means that it's very difficult to distinguish between what Huawei, Samsung, or Apple might have. If you want to develop even an incremental idea, you need to create an absolutely new product set so you aren't infringing on any laws. We think that this is often overwhelming and discourages these small companies from innovating. All of these reasons can only exist when big companies have the capital and scale to patent many things. So they're inherent to big companies holding patents. When these small companies are discouraged from innovation, we lose out on choice. On to my third point of positive matter, which is how we're going to tell you we change the behavior between big and small companies. Currently, we see big companies buying up smaller ones for three reasons. In the minority of cases, they want to develop the idea holistically. But secondly, sometimes they only want a small component Quantum such as a piece of the code, and they have no interest whatsoever in <coughs> developing the idea to, to its full potential. Or thirdly, they use it as a defensive strategy to prevent others from accessing it, or to prevent that smaller company becoming a competitor. And a good example here is when Google spent $12 billion buying up Motorola, Mo Motorola and all 20,000 of its patents, only to use one for their operating system. They then resulted in all the other patents being stagnated and sold the company for $4 billion without its patents. We say Quite. that all of these acquisitions are anti-competitive and are done for reasons other than protecting innovation. So how does our policy change this? Small companies are more valuable now as standalone entities rather than instruments subsumed into a larger conglomerate. Because when big companies buy these smaller ones now, their patents are going to be locked. The idea is going to become available to everyone. So instead of buying up a white elephant just to boost their market value, they're now only going to be buying for legitimate reasons where they actually want to take full advantage of that idea. Secondly, we've reduced barriers to entry. We get more startups and more jobs. For example, in 2002 in the United Kingdom, where small innovation firms only accounted for 6% of total firms, but accounted for 54% of job creation. But lastly, we support more independent smaller companies because of the way they operate. They typically use licensing, which means that they make their ideas available to almost everyone, and we can have collaboration. 
when they overcome their initial development cycle, they often use an exponential growth phase where they rapidly bring on new ideas and are still agile and not bound by big company bureaucracy. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these reasons mean that we get better innovation and more consumer choice. When big companies hold patents, they're stifling innovation, whether they're doing so purposefully or not. We stand for innovation. We stand for a better technology industry. We stand for the proposition. Thank you, Rebecca, for your speech. Speaking time was 8 minutes and 12 seconds. I, I'd not like to call Karthik to give his speech. Ten years ago, to detect diabetes, you needed to be rich enough to get a full body checkup with a specialist. Today, after cycles of patenting and licensing, medical tech has rapidly advanced to the point where you can buy affordable diabetes tests from the pharma giant Ranbaxy at $4, even in the developing world, and save thousands of lives. Okay, let's clarify some truths about patents that Team South Africa tried to obscure. To file one, you need to publicly disclose all details about the product, including the materials and procedure, so it isn't a trade secret. And any other company can reproduce those per technology as long as they buy a license from the inventor, as they pointed out. The system of licensing is what allows innovation, meaning that startups can cheaply access technology that Google spent billions of dollars developing just by buying a license and use it as the basis for their groundbreaking idea. That's something you can't have on their side when Google doesn't have the incentive to do that at all. Because we believe that patents make big companies work for everyone. Our burden today is to show you that a world with reasonable patent laws and non discriminatory patent protection is better for consumers. Their burden is to explicitly establish how big companies use patents to entrench monopolies and hurt consumers. They can't win if they don't do this. What is our model? First, enforcement of antitrust law to investigate monopolies or oligopolies on a case-by-case -case basis. Second, the expansion of eminent domain to intellectual property. If there's significant public need for a product, States should be able to purchase the patent for it at market price and distribute free licenses to Sorry. domestic manufacturers. No. We support the reform of patent laws wherever needed to prevent abuse like patent trolling and evergreening. This is already the case in most countries, including South Africa. Sorry. Our policy Sorry. means they can't win this debate by pointing out problems with the status quo. Those can be resolved through patent law reform. They have to explicitly point out problems that can only be solved by discriminating on the basis of market share. We have five arguments to bring you today. First, on why companies have no inherent right to compete. Second, why large companies are better at innovating. And third, why their policy entrenches monopolies. My second speaker will tell you why their policy hurts groundbreaking technologies and developing countries. But before that, some rebuttal. No. First, it says big companies buy patents more than they do research. Firstly, this is absolutely false. They provided absolutely no evidence. Second, they have to buy patents to avoid being sued by smaller companies. When their technology involves so many thousands of parts, they have no idea if some, of, some company that patented one obscure technology 100 years ago is going to actually sue them for it. That's why they buy these patents up to avoid being sued. Second, they did not define a significant market share. You cannot debate this debate without understanding what a big company is. You can't say this company is big, this company is not without giving us a significant market share to define that. It's a significant failing on their side. The second speaker needs to come and ratify it. Third, the acquisitions are anti-competitive. This was incredibly assertive with absolutely no basis Sorry. at all, right? We think that when companies as, uh, acquire other companies, like when Facebook integrated WhatsApp and Snapchat, it's to provide better services in a more integrated manner to consumers. That's something we support. Next, they said that we help startups by reducing barriers to entry. The thing is, they hurt startups because under their policy, a startup has its patents voided if it gets bought up by a bigger company. This structurally disincentivizes R&D, even in smaller companies, because they can be like, taken over hostilely by a bigger company. They want to get acquired if they 
they want to have a more integrated structure in which to do research, they can't have that on their side. That's why they disincentivize small companies even on their side. My first argument is to why companies have to ahead right to compete. Competition is good only insofar as it benefits consumers. Let's be clear, companies are constructs meant to serve consumers. How is this true? We see in the status quo that companies are allowed to fail if they can't compete in the market. The only time we bail out companies is to protect workers and consumers, like the bailout of General Motors. We only become protect companies when it protects real people. Given that 90% of startups fail in their first year, we allow them to fail because it paves the way for better companies to provide better services to real people. Consumer-based market intervention is something that we support like antitrust law and eminent domain, because that helps people more than just random arbitrary market check criteria. Let's tie this back. If big companies researching leads to better outcomes for consumers, then we absolutely support that, even at the expense of small companies, because we care more about sick children in India who need medicine than a white boy startup club in Silicon Valley. This directly rebuts the point of the risk that small companies face in the status quo. First, we don't actually care. We think that it's better outcomes for consumers on our side. Second, even in their world, it's quite hard because they don't have capital or risk aversion. I'll tell you about that later. So my second argument, as to why only large companies are capable of meaningful innovation, but yes. So this is just begging the question. Big companies, small companies can only use the patents of big companies if big companies allow them to and allow them to sell Yes, I'll tell you why. Because they get money from licensing fees and they also can't service the entire market by themselves, right? Apple has a 14% share in the smartphone market. It can't service the other 86%, but it can license patents out to manufacturers who do. That's where it makes money. That's why it's better on our side. Second argument is why only large companies are capable of meaningful innovation. How is this true? First, research is risky. You have no guarantee of solving the problem regardless of the money you spend. And even if you do solve it, you have to hope that you were the first one to do so. Because often many companies work on the same problem, like smartphone fingerprinting, but only one of them gets the patent while the rest of them make a loss. They only can do this because they have hundreds of assured income streams and multiple ventures. That's why like Google is able to pour $10 billion into Google Glass with no return when a, when a startup could never do that because the startup is much more risk averse because it doesn't have this kind of capital. Importantly, this is true even in their world. It is absolutely independent of patent protection to large companies. Second, because big companies have the ability and capital to hire the best of the best for research. MIT's best are drafted by Google's and Apple's best every year. They're given expensive technology to work with and billion dollar budgets that lean startups can't provide them. That's why they're able to develop Sorry. smartphone fingerprinting, 5G, more efficient solar panels. And this again is true of independent of patents and true even in their world. So that's why when their principal focus is on innovation, Sorry. we're showing you how big companies do it even better than small companies. So why does this matter? Because their case is premised on the assumption that large companies holding patents stifles innovation. This is false. We showed you that large companies and their patented research are the best innovators even on their side. A policy that disincentivizes them from patenting research and putting it in the public domain for people to see and license out is harmful to innovation, right? So second, on why, uh, third, on why removing patent protection from large companies entrenches monopolies. How is this true? First, the innovator-manufacturer relationship. In the smartphone market, giants like Apple and Samsung patent fingerprinting and license it out to smaller manufacturers, like Motorola, who put it in their phones and mass produce them. That's why I have, a, I have fingerprinting on my Motorola phone, even though Apple is the one who patented it. Because Apple and Samsung can't service the entire smartphone market with this tech, and they gain from the licensing fees that they can get. What drives down smartphone prices for the rest of us and helps us consumers is because even as they add this groundbreaking technology, manufacturers like Motorola and HTC have to compete with each other. This isn't affected by patents. In fact, it's even worse at their side. Why? Because second, patent force competition at the top. Apple and so, Samsung, in the status quo, race to the patent office so they can get the most licensing fees and from, the, from these manufacturers. The comparative in this debate is that when Apple loses patent protection, it still innovates, right? It still has a profit motive, yeah. but it now has no incentive to provide that to smaller companies from a license. It only will provide it in iPhones instead of in all other phones, turning the technology into a trade secret that only they can use and that nobody else can use. This is true of fingerprinting, 5G, cloud computing, and everything that a smartphone can have. In their world, only giants have this technology and they have no competition because nobody else can make it without the patent information. Why does this matter? Because in our world, technology advances at light speed and prices fall steadily. This innovator manufacturer synergy that forces competition to the top is the reason we have throttling power of smartphones 
quadrupling even as the price has fallen from $440 to $260 in the past five years. This is not a market where it takes 20 years to develop anything because of a patent. It's a market where technology becomes obsolete in two years because of the fact that if you just try to hang on to your obsolete product, it's going to actually just not do anything at all. It's going to be outpaced by better technology. Because patents make big companies work for everyone, I beg you to oppose. Thank you for your speech. Speaking time was eight minutes and eight seconds. In the last 10 years, technology companies in Silicon Valley have seen a 10% increase in pay patenting. But this has only corresponded in a 2% reduction in research and development. We have seen a corrosive over-patenting culture in which patents are used as a sword to stab competition instead of being used as a shield to protect innovation. In my speech, I'm going to show you how we encourage more competition between large companies, achieving the innovation and better products that they want. But before we do that, we need to do some rebuttal. Firstly, why is our Team India strategically off the foot in today's debate? They've conceded our principle, our principle that the reason patents exist is to protect utility, to protect the most vulnerable actors within a market and allow them to have a time period to incubate their inventions and grow. We think that these are small companies. I'm going to show you why their matter specifically concedes that small companies are at risk and that they deserve the patents. But secondly, they've conceded reform. They've said that they as a side are willing to impose things just as antitrust laws to combat and crack down on monopolies, failing to remember that companies with significant market shares are specifically monopolies. They have a 10% to 15% share in the market. But secondly, patents are a way of entrenching those monopolies. Why? Because what a patent does is it says that you are the only actor that it can exclusively reproduce and distribute a product. That is one way in which monopolies are created. We think that if they concede that the reform is necessary, this is the most effective way of achieving that reform. A blanket policy and a firm policy that says you are not allowed to have patents and we don't allow these companies to skirt around whatever reform that Point you propose. So two questions now that the context has been established to ask. One, do companies have an inherent right to have patents so that they can compete? And secondly, which side is best for the consumers? To answer the first question, they needed to engage with the Rebecca's analysis, which told you that no company in the world has an inherent right to access patents, given that they have no claim to ownership and that this ownership isn't based on whether or not you deserve sole access and control over an idea. Given that that is the case, we think that the reason we give patents is to protect innovation for the actors that require this the most. What did they tell us? They firstly told us that technology industry is one which is capital intensive and that big companies take a lot of risks and they need to have a grace period so that they can be protected from risk. Firstly, this isn't the case. It might be in the case of a generic debate about pharmaceutical companies, which isn't today's debate. We're talking about technology companies, in which a lot of innovation happens in garages in California, in which the barriers to entry in terms of innovation are really low. But secondly, assuming that was the context, we don't think big companies deserve patents to begin with, right? Because they gave us a pretty 
clear description of how big companies have massive budgets that they can direct to research and development, how they have massive innovation teams that they can direct to research and development, right? We think if it's so expensive on their side, which big companies can afford these expenses, then who are the actors who can't afford these expenses? They are the small companies that we think these patents need to be protecting, right? We think we're going to show you why that's important later. But secondly, why do we think that big companies require these patents for that incubation period? Firstly, it's not necessary for them, right? Rebecca told you how big companies already have access to critical support in that they have existing consumer bases to market their products. Even if an idea fails, you're still likely to make profit because Google, Facebook, Apple already have loyal consumers based on the product ecosystems that they've already created. But secondly, they have existing incentive structures. They have board members and shareholders who want them to continuously innovate or willing to give them cash to innovate even if patents don't exist on our side. We say that these big companies don't need them. So who needs patents in this case? Why do we want to take away patents from companies with significant market share that have access to these resources? Because it's hurting small companies, right? We told you how that firstly, patents hurt small companies because given that big companies at the moment, which is why we're having this debate in the technology industry, are over-patenting, right? They're over-patenting not because they want to protect innovation, but because they fear that another company is going to get a patent before them and they're going to exclude them from using that very same product. This leads to firstly things such as patent thickets, in which you have a mass web of overlapping patents in which small companies can't navigate around. They can't navigate around because they firstly don't know which company owns that patent, and then the instances in which multiple companies own those patents, they don't know who to speak to for licensing, right? They tell us that licensing is no longer going to exist under the circumstance. That's a good thing, right? That's a silver bullet because these small companies are going to get these ideas for free. They're going to be able to use these technologies for free, use a lot of the software for free, which is something that we want. Yes, sir. You still haven't defined what a significant market share. How can we have this debate? to 15% of an industry. We think these are companies such as Apple, Google, and Facebook. We've already defined that in our context. So we need to protect small companies. And we think that once they innovate, we get a lot of new ideas and public goods that are released to the market. But why are they better for big companies and competition there? This is my point of substantive matter. We think at the moment, patents give companies the sole power to produce and distribute a product, effectively excluding anyone else from doing this. We think that this monopoly effectively gives them freedom to use them however they want, which means that we see things such as inflated prices for products, which hurts the accessibility that they want on their side. Secondly, some optimal quality of products, seeing it at a lower quality than in which it otherwise would have been without the patent because they're only ones making them. And thirdly, complacent innovation. We change that in two ways. Firstly, encouraging more competition in quality and price, and secondly, encouraging more innovation. Firstly, with regards to quality and price, we say that when you no longer have the sole ability to produce and distribute a product, because everyone else is now doing it as well, you have to find different ways of differentiating within the market. Firstly, this is likely to happen with quality. We think companies can redirect resources that they otherwise would have been spending on hectic patent litigation, which is 250 million for Apple in 2014, more than they spent developing in the Apple iPhone, to do things like improve the quality of a product, using things such as more durable materials, assembling it with more structure integrity. This is good for consumers. But secondly, in terms of price, they want cheap products on their side. We are likely to get more cheap products on our side because now you have an incentive to gain a competitive advantage over other companies to lower your prices. Because if everyone is making the same thing, one way of differentiating yourself is to make your things cheaper. This applies to hardware. But secondly, in terms of software, we think we get more open source code available to the market. This is a very good thing because now when it's free, when you no longer have to pay licensing fees, we're going to get more and more people using this code. This can lead to more innovative projects breaking our society, reaching a critical mass of usage in which we're likely to see new developments. We think that companies will have to figure out ways of trying to monetize these um, uh, adventures, but that's a good thing, right? They can do things like having um, some aspects of it paid and other aspects of it non-paid. We see this already with games when they are in-app purchases for products. The conclusion here is that different consumers have different needs, and we tailor to those needs specifically when companies deal with it. Secondly, more innovation is encouraged, right? Companies at the moment are prepared to accept slower innovation because they have innovation pipelines. They're ready to launch new features much later because they already have patented, protected products which are successful. The example of this is the iPhone 4, which was ready to have the fingerprint lock feature, but in which Apple deferred it to the iPhone 6. 
sex because there was no need for them to do that. They felt that they had enough distinct features. We think that once we remove the monopoly, you have to innovate much quicker because the innovation cycle of a product is dependent on how much quicker another company can emulate you, right? So you launch things at once. You have to launch things much quicker before another company begins to emulate you. That's a good thing. But secondly, that you have an incentive to release products, ideas, and prototypes to the market first so that you can undercut the potential for small companies to patent you because then the idea will no longer be novel. Ladies and gentlemen, we've shown you that we get more innovation, we get cheaper products, and we get more qualitative products. I'm proud to propose. For your speech, speaking time was 8 minutes and 13 seconds. I'm going to win this debate for opposition in the first one minute of my speech. Steam South Africa have structurally failed in this debate in multiple ways. Why? Because in their first speech, firstly, they failed to tell us what a significant market share is, and for the entirety of their PM speech, decided to debate this debate in some random hypothetical scenario. Second, because they never told us why, because a majority of their argument was about why some patents can be bad and never structurally told us why patents for big companies is bad. Third, because they never told us why technology companies, they never told us what the unique utility was for restricting this to only technology industry and not to other industries according to their definition. Third, because they never told us why discrimination in patents was the only way to attack the problems they identified. They never told us why, if their problem is things like monopolies, why competition laws that already exist in the EU, for example, don't address these problems. Fifth, because they told, never told you why companies should be the priority of a state over the people of that state. When we, in our first speech, established to you that our principle is that we should care for consumers and laborers, they failed to attack it and asserted that some company that is bound to fail and doesn't have enough innovation is more important. But finally, they, the death blow to their own case was when they never told us why a significant market share was going to translate into more patents apart from asserting that it was the so a few areas of rebuttal before I move on to my constructors. First, about their model. Only in the second speech, they define market share to be 15%. Not only is this completely arbitrary and quite bizarre because they're applying one number to all industries as if all industries are homogeneous, this just drops a large part of the debate out of the debate. For example, Intel and microprocessors, Apple and smartphones, uh, Intel and Amazon and cloud computing, for example, which of all by their arguments would be big companies, don't fit uh, in this debate according to their model. Therefore, a large part of their case is irrelevant. Second, they told you that big companies, when bought by small, big, when big companies buy small companies, they won't allow them to hold on to those patents. What they therefore do is to punish innovation in small companies. They tell you that small companies now have to make a trade-off between research and development and growth and being a small player and having significant amounts of profit. In their world, the business plan of growing and getting and merging with a big company is invalidated. They are the one restricting the choices of small companies. Third, 
because they never they, they mischaracterize to you what patents were and when we challenge them in our first speech saying patents are in vague ideas but are rather structural products that you can show and have to reveal information about it to the public they just randomly talk to us about why some patent laws require reform rather than addressing their burden in this debate therefore we've already won on these grounds but what is the major clash they brought to us they talked to us about small companies i'm going to take this down in two ways first in terms of principle i've already told you why according to them we should talk about the vulnerable actor and therefore the people are the vulnerable actor for a state and not some random small company that is failing Therefore, this argument by definition doesn't matter so long as we showed you in our first speech that innovation is good for consumers and innovation only happens on our side. But second, we think their policy rather affects uh, harm, harm small companies rather than benefiting them. What were the analysis they gave you? First, they talked to you about litigation. No, at the point at which companies are going to be seen as monstrous predatory companies that are buying and attacking small companies, we think they're not going to indulge in litigation. But Sorry. second, they can't just talk about vague patents because obviously we don't have to defend bad patent laws. We think small companies don't pay, uh, uh, if, if their argument is that small companies can't defend themselves from litigation, then by their definition, small companies don't have enough money on research and development either, and that for a large part of their case is irrelevant. But finally, they tell, tell you that licensing doesn't happen. No, at the point at which technology innovation is so fast paced that three months after you make one innovation, another company is going to be making it. We think that this means that the only window you get is that four month period where you can license your product to other companies. Therefore, when they only talk to you about the exceptional cases that start off in garages and make it to billion dollar industries, but what we told you was 90% of startups fail in their first year and therefore big companies are structurally Sir. better to make innovation. We won this debate on their terms also. But finally, they failed in this debate because the only way of solving this uh, debate for them was that they took down monopolies. But we already asked you why don't competition laws work and we don't have to defend pay, uh, bad patent laws. Therefore, rather, we think monopolies increase on their side of the house when the big companies can't, can't pay in and therefore the incentive for them becomes to be the exclusive owner of the technology and don't allow other companies to access it, thereby entrenching their position in the market. Cheap products that they talk to you about don't exist because small companies can no longer license from big companies and make their products. And so it. given that this idea for big companies now available to everyone, they can't own it. Instead of Apple and Samsung suing each other over lock screen, they now have to compete for a better lock screen. But at the point at which the only problem they have to you is that some patents might be frivolous, but fail to engage on our idea of how a majority of patents, the most patents, apart from some screws or some design, but rather actual technology, like for example fingerprint technology, are actually important, <laughs> they automatically lose this debate. What are my two constructors in this debate? Firstly, how they disallow groundbreaking technology from coming into existence. Combating climate change and illness are, for example, very important concerns of technological development. Groundbreaking technologies like green technology, electric cars, genetic, genetic modification, or even day-to-day -day ones like virtual reality headsets or smartphones are important to come because they radically change our way of life. The unique risk in these forms of technology is that the market for this doesn't exist. Therefore, companies spend billions and years on technology that doesn't exist by creating it from scratch. They will operate out of two incentives here. One, the gamble that the innovation hits it off, and that when it does, they can license it to other producers and out profit out of the competition. And second, they depend Sorry. on the ability to be the unique producer of this technology who licenses this out to other companies. Because on their side of the house, five minutes after this product hits the market, it will be ripped off by some other company. Companies now know that there will be no returns for groundbreaking innovation that they spend years and billions on. So one, either this means that there is no incentive for groundbreaking research and innovation reduces, spending on these forms of innovation reduces from billions to millions. But even otherwise, even when Nissan continues to spend apparently on their side of the house, $5.6 billion on green technology, they don't reveal this technology to the public and keep the cost at such a high rate that it becomes inaccessible to majority of the world. The only profit on their side of the house comes for these big companies by being the exclusive owner, the entrenched and monopolized owner of this technology. Rather, we allow this groundbreaking technology to be made and to be made accessible by our model of m and domains. Therefore, on their side of the house, the most affected by climate change, that is the Bangladeshi farmers, will never be able to access the green technology that is uniquely important to them. Second constructive, how they disproportionately affect the developing world. We already told you how startups use existing patents to make cheaper versions of those products. The entrenchment they create is that the class divide grows when big companies in their best case make innovation
information, but still don't reveal them to small companies and don't sell at accessible rate. Therefore, on their to the house, when the Western world is at artificial kidneys, the developing world will still be using archaic dialysis machines. They entrench a gap that denies the poor of the world any form of upward mobility. But secondly, specifically about universities, the only other place where meaningful innovation happens is in universities because states get the brightest minds at the lowest cost in these areas. Obviously, therefore, they can't do research and development from scratch and make everything from the start because on their the house, that's what they have to do when companies don't license and don't produce. Therefore, only on our side does the Indian Institute of Technology use existing smartphone patents to make a tablet that costs $4 and provides access to digital technology to the poor, poor of India. Therefore, they shut down a unique avenue to provide inno cheap innovation to the poor. They systematically deny the developing world any form of upward mobility. This is quietly one of the greatest times to be alive. We moved from petrol to unleaded petrol to solar cars. And patents are therefore one of the biggest drivers that make big companies work for everyone. Very proud to oppose. Speaking time was 8 minutes and 20 seconds. Patents are being used to wage a war in the technology industry, and that war has become a toll gate on the road to innovation and development. I'm going to do two things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to show you why big companies don't deserve patents, and secondly, I'm going to show you why we get better innovation and competition on our side. But before that, I want to do three points of strategic clarity. So they've conceded that we should optimize the patent industry in order to get innovation. Strategically, what this means for us is we're going to use all their reasons why these companies are so big, and if they have so many resources, why they're still going to continue to innovate, mixed with our reasons as to why they still have an incentive to innovate, to show you that there's going to still be the same amount of development from big companies, and all that we improve is the ability for small companies to break into the market and have better competition. And we're going to show you why our side is optimal. The second thing I want to talk about is the nature of a big market. We told you why being in a big market specifically means that you have added advantages, which means that you can exclude people arbitrarily through legal and pay, legal routes and patenting routes. They ask us, what is the definition of a big company? Well, 10 to 15%, we can alter it per part of the industry. We don't think that the, that should be the point of this debate. We think that this debate should be about the principle of whether or not this is something that should happen. Thirdly, we told you why technology specifically. We say there were three reasons for this that have been ignored. Firstly, is that it's the nature of the industry. Generally, you have one patent for one product, like in pharmaceuticals, when you can patent one strand or one molecule. This is different in the case of the technology industry because products are made up of a multitude of different products, and that means that you have to patent all of them. Secondly, we told you about the unique benefit that the technology industry supplies. It means that cheaper goods into the developing world mean more economic development. Thirdly, we told you in technology specifically, unlike any other industry, there is a corrosive patent culture. People patent as much as possible because they fear exclusion from other big companies that are doing exactly the same thing. And it creates a race to the bottom to acquire as many patents as possible, even if it's unfair. So given that that is the strategic background, let's show you why in two clashes why we've won this debate. So firstly, when should people own patents? We tell you that you should have a patent and you have a right to it when it is necessary in order to develop and innovate a product. So what are the reasons that we gave you that haven't been responded to? We'd also like to point out the fact that they haven't given us a reason as to why these big companies are going to stop innovating. The reason is, is that it's false. So big companies don't need these patents. Why? Firstly, they have boards and shareholders which continuously impress upon them to order to innovate and to develop their products. Secondly, they have an incentive to push their brand value as an innovative brand. 
a study done by Lab42 indicated that 83% of people are willing to buy from a company simply because they perceive it to be innovative. That means you have an incentive to innovate as much as possible. Thirdly, they often have captive markets. That means that people constantly buy iPhones year after year, even though there are other products and other competitions. The reason that you have that captive market means that you can continue to produce and it has an incentive to continue to produce because you're always going to sell. Fourthly, we told you that the costs of development for these companies are relatively small. It's relatively small for you to develop a new product, but it's massive revenue that proportionately that you earn from the product means that you have less or little uh, of a need for patents. We told you it was different in the instance of a small company. It's often the times that they are releasing brand new right. products. They don't have pre-existing, no thank you, brands and marketing. They have to invest in brand and marketing as well. They're often come, uh, supported by twitchy investors that are willing to pull funding when the competition seems as if it's going to get too strong or the company seems to get to a point where it fails. That means that you, small companies uniquely have a need in order to have these patents in order to develop their products. Secondly, now that we've discovered why we think and why on the principle we believe that big companies don't deserve patents, let's look as to why we get better and more innovation and competition on our side. Firstly, what they tell you is that big companies are better at developing products, and that means that it's unfair to exclude them from being able to own patents. But all the reasons that they give you, the fact that they have incredibly large resources in order to develop and innovate, the fact that they have large amounts of teams and legal resources, all of those things are reasons as to why they can compete without a patent anyway. They can forge large amounts of resources and capital into research. They still have an incentive, as we've already shown you. I'll take you in a second. And we think that in those instances, it's incredibly important that these companies are still able to compete, whereas small companies comparatively wouldn't be able to. If the if five months after a big company makes a product, it will be ripped off and a new product, a cheaper version will come into the market, what incentive exists to innovate on your set of Okay, So firstly, it doesn't take five minutes. It takes about four to six months, which means that you have time to establish and develop a product mm -hmm. and its brand. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we believe that under our side, you still have an incentive to be the first mover because you are the innovative brand value that has created a new product. That means even if you're not the best possible person at producing that good, you have at least been the first person to produce it and that means that you still have that brand value and still have an incentive. But thirdly, if you don't patent something and if you, if you don't produce it on our side, there is a chance that a small company is going to patent it from you before you get the chance to produce it. In those cases, we believe that it's incredibly important that these big companies are continuously innovating. So response to that POI, very simple. Secondly, they tell you that small companies are worse at developing because they have higher risks. That's true, they do have higher risks, which is a reason why they should have increased protection and we think that they deserve that protection. But secondly, just because they are worse compared in making products doesn't try to stop them from trying, such as V-Lingo, which is trying to develop WhatsApp. All of these big companies, uh, sorry, it's, it's a voice, a voice recognition. All of these companies like WhatsApp and Facebook started small at some point and they took those risks. And we think that in order to take those risks, you need protection. And that's something that we protect for uniquely and they don't. Thirdly, they tell you about licensing. So this doesn't make any sense. Companies only license when they want to. So Apple doesn't license in the instance when they don't have to. They don't license their OS to other people. Secondly, under our side, we think that smaller companies don't have to license, and that's better for them. Because licensing gives comparatively a small amount of revenue to these big companies, but it's a significant cost to small companies, when small companies no longer have to license their goods and continue to produce them, we get not only cheaper goods to the market, but we get more development on goods, because it's not just one company that a, that a big company can choose to license their product to. It can be the entire market. That means we get better and more development and cheaper goods on our side of the house when small companies don't have to jump through the hoop of licensing. But we also tell you that this doesn't always happen. Licensing is often a way of excluding other people from producing your good. So generally, they have a broad or general patent, and they use that to sue other companies out of the competition, such as Apple did with V-Lingo, when they sue them until the point at which they were bankrupt. We think that in those cases, we need to be able to protect smaller companies for the innovative designs. And then they tell you small companies just don't want to compete because they're going to get bought out at some point. But we don't think that getting successful is a reason why a small company isn't going to compete. We think that in the instance that they have venture capital, they don't have to get bought out by a bigger company. But even if you do, just losing your patent isn't a reason enough to stop developing. Because we've given you reasons as to why companies that are big enough that they're going to lose their patent still have an incentive and still have the means necessary in order to develop and compete. So, Lastly, what do we tell you about big companies competing with other big companies? Because we're going to bring this back because it wasn't responded to. We think that they, no thank you, in the instance, uh, in the status quo, they can gain an artificial monopoly with patents. So Apple TV can have a uh, Apple-based broadcast which they can patent and no one else can use it. In those cases, they can compete simply by having a unique product. That means that there's no incentive for them to make the product cheaper. There's no incentive for them to make the product better because they know that they're the only ones selling it and that gives them a unique advantage. When it changes on our side, the big companies are forced to compete 
compete on price, on quality, on marketing and design. Those things are what changes on our side. What they tell us is that we are going to get innovation from these companies. They're going to stop because it's too risky. We've already told you why we think this isn't the case. But we think that often it's the situation in the technology industry where the costs of research are incredibly low. And we think that we've given you responses. So lastly, they tell us about the developing world. They say that it's worse for the developing world because in the developing world, they are no longer allowed to license products. No, it's better for the developing world because they don't have to license products and continue with those extreme costs. But then they say that these big companies aren't going to develop or announce their goods. But they always have an incentive to announce their goods because if they don't, a small company can patent it before they announce it, which means they'll have no ability to produce it. So what we told you here is that we get better products, we get cheaper products, and we get them faster to the market. You have to side with side proposition if you want to debate a team that has won today's debate. Speaking time was 8 minutes and 11 seconds. There are two main plot holes in Proposition's case that lose them the debate right now. Firstly, they gave you only one reason as to why they think that the current uh, status quo is a problem, frivolous patents. They did not anticipate that we'd actually have a solution. They did not anticipate that we would say things like eminent domain, that we would suggest things like antitrust laws, that we would suggest things like government funding. And as a result, they gave us no rebuttals. Let's look at what that means for their case. That means they've asserted a bunch of problems and we've given you another solution. And they have not given you a single reason as to why our solutions don't work. Not one. And as a result, we are clearly winning this debate at this point of time. The second problem is that once more, they assume that we would tell them that large companies don't innovate anymore on their side. But no. What did we tell you? We told you that yes, they're definitely going to innovate, but they're not going to reveal this information. We gave you reasons as to why they're not going to reveal this information, but they did not rebut that. Not one Sorry. reason on their side of the house as to why large companies are likely to re release that information. Sorry. We told you they can easily codify their algorithms, they can easily suppress information through their engines, and as a result, information Sorry. stays suppressed on their side of the house. No rebuttal to do these two key points which already win us this debate. So what are the main questions sir. you need to ask? No, sir. Now, firstly, let's look at whether or not they claim, whether or not companies have the right to patents. They came up here and tried to label us as not fulfilling our burden when we didn't show that patents are an inherent right for big companies. No, we never claimed that. It is a lie for them to come up here and tell us that it's our duty to defend the ability of large or small companies to have patents. Our principle is pretty simple. We care about the consumers. We don't even care about those small companies. They aren't the most vulnerable stakeholders involved. We care about the people who get this comfort, who get this quality. We don't care about who makes the computer chip. We care about how many laptops are out there, how cheap those laptops are, and how many people can afford to buy them. That is the baseline. That is the principle Sorry. which they have failed to acknowledge throughout this debate. So let's look at how they actually plan on taking out this policy and that highlights how redundant this policy is. Firstly, in their first speech, they didn't define market share. In their second speech, they came up here and told you that it's 10 to 15 percent. Then when my second speaker came up here and showed you how that's absolutely horrid and in things like niche markets where there is bound to be a statistical monopoly, in things like new markets where obviously certain companies are going to have monopolies over a, uh, over a short period of time, they disincentivize that. They disincentivize research into green technology, into places, into new fields which they have to create. They did not respond to this. Later they came in their whip and tried to mitigate this by saying obviously we'll change parts of this as per industry. But at that point, it was pretty clear that their entire policy was redundant. Because let's look at the companies that they actually miss on their side with this 10 to 15 percent market share. Toshiba, second largest patent producer in the world, 30,000 patents, has only 5 percent market share. Not a part of this debate. Novartis, only 4 percent market share. It's a pharma company. They cannot come up here and pretend that these companies don't fall into this debate. Why? 
Firstly, because the pharma industry is very rich in patents. They have the second most patents filed and they have the second most R&D budgets over across the world. And furthermore, we don't see why there's a principal distinction. People use pharma technology as well. And that technology does involve large amounts of R&D. None of their analysis, which they apply to IT, can't be applied to pharma. We don't see why they draw that distinction. So what does that mean for their case? Basically, it means, number one, that they're not really getting these large companies which they want to get. And number two, what they're doing is these small patents, these small number of patents, which, are, which Proposition Whip told us were filed, are no longer incentivized. The pharma industry and research is disincentivized in that case because patents are in a small amount or you could go with our counter assertion and say that they hide the information <coughs> on both sides. It's extremely harmful for their case as a whole. So now the second question. Let's look at the status quo so and how... Yes, sir. So the reason that these companies have an incentive to release or to announce their information is because if they don't, there's a chance that a small company is going to patent it before they can release it. Exactly. Also, they have an incentive to be innovative. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So you do realize that when Apple has thousands and thousands and thousands of line of code, it's extremely simple for them to implement this small one line of algorithm, which you've been telling us is the patent in the entire debate, into their code and go unseen. We tell you it's extremely easy for, for we tell you it's extremely easy for automobile industries to hide certain key advancements in their engines. You needed to tell us throughout the speeches as to why they're likely to be able to make up for this shortfall. You cannot assert a counter a, a rebuttal in a POI and expect to win that point. We win on that very idea as a whole. So let's look at the status quo and what either side have told you. They said they they support small companies. Firstly, their proposition whip came up here and told you why that's a horrible idea. They give you structural reasons as to why small companies have less funding, they have not really dependable shareholders, and then they're depending on these people to make our heart monitors. They're depending on these small companies, which are extremely risk averse, to make extremely big developments. We say no. We say we like the way it's going on right now with large companies which have no risk aversion comparatively to take that. The only problem they provided in this entire status quo was privileged patents. Every problem they said originated from that. Stagnation of quality because they use defensive patents which are irrelevant. Litigation because they use privileged patents. They did not respond to our analysis on how we don't have to support that. On how places like New Zealand, Australia, India and South Africa don't support that in the status quo. And patents aren't really a problem over there. They have not responded to that key bit of analysis. Furthermore, we tell you that sometimes these incremental patents that they say are extremely relevant and when they increase the speed of processors, they can be useful. Okay, what lastly did they tell you under this specific point? They told you in their whip speech that they're unlikely to ever license out information. Not true. Licensing is extremely profitable. Qualcomm makes 75% of its profit from licensing out its products alone. Windows makes more profit from licensing out licenses to companies like Samsung and HTC than selling Windows phones in itself. Licensing is extremely profitable. They are very likely to do that on, on either side of the house. The thing is that on their side of the house, they take away the ability to pay. They take away the ability to license in the first place. They cannot pretend that's a good thing so, because it's horrible. I'll show you why but before that. So small companies can license to each other, but they will have full access and freedom to access the ideas of bigger companies. That's a good thing because it means it's easy. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so firstly, let's look at what, like you still have not responded to our analysis on how you can't license something if you don't know how the technology works. You can't just open up any sort of kidney uh, dialysis machine and figure out where it goes looking at the pipes over there. They have to have given us a reason throughout their speeches as to how access comes to small companies. This technology has it does not come to small companies as we have shown you. They haven't given you reasons why they do. And that and lastly, the third question of the debate, what does it look like in the long term? They do not reduce any barriers to entry on their side of the house. Because licensing, frankly, aids people. You cannot say that small companies can now make their own Google Glass and then make incremental changes. Right now in the status quo, they make only the incremental changes. They are best suited for that. At the end of this debate, what have they done? Firstly, they have disregarded my second speaker's entire analysis on developing countries and universities and how these are largely harmed. Basically, meaning that they exclude 4 billion people from this debate and we de facto win right now. And in the end, they have failed to respond to our solutions. Our solutions solve any problem they could do. Even if we can see the large part of this debate as the problems that do exist, we better solve them on our side of the house. It's not a principal contradiction for us to say that we foster some change. That's not what we stand for. We stand for the people. We say that patents make large companies work for everyone. Very proud of the Thank <laughs> you.
It's not my pleasure to ask Karfik to give the opposition's reply speech. Before I go into the one and only question in this debate, I have three general comments as to why South Africa has already lost this debate without even getting into the clashes. First, because they tried to win this debate by obfuscating basic facts about patents. Like the fact that patent information has to be completely in the public domain where it can be reproduced by anyone with a license who pays the patent holder a license fee. They tried to say that this is some sort of predatory thing that they use as a monopoly that they can use for 20 years. Completely ignoring the analysis we gave you and the real world we live in that there is no monopoly for 20 years that technology becomes obsolete within two years. They ignored the fact that on their side, what they have are trade secrets, where companies don't patent it, but instead keep it secret. As our second and third speaker clearly stated, this is what's going to happen when they can't patent it. They're still going to innovate. That's the case they didn't prepare for. We said they are going to innovate. They're still going to innovate, but they're not going to do it publicly. That's why they're not going to do it and have any sort of benefit on their side. They tried to ignore the second thing is that they dropped all our arguments on how this was groundbreaking green technology. They dropped their arguments on developing countries and they dropped their arguments on entrenching monopolies. Three key, three key arguments as to why our side wins and their side doesn't. I really wish this could be a clash in this debate since they didn't engage on it, it can't. And third, because they didn't show any kind of exclusivity between our solutions and theirs. They simply asserted that us providing any sort of solution is a concession that they win. What? The fact is, we recognize that in the status quo, first, most of our policies already exist, like eminent domain and antitrust law, and second, that the fact that there can be some sort of abuse of patents is not a reason to arbitrarily demarcate market share and say, this is where you have patents, this is where you don't. We were the reasonable side who recognized that some patent law reform can solve all the problems they want to talk about and they don't need to have this arbitrary market share demarcation in order to solve those problems. They weren't prepared for that, they couldn't engage with it, that's why we already win this debate. So my second, the first and only question in this debate, which side has more and better innovation? We gave you key analysis on licensing, why in the status quo, the system of licensing allows multiple companies to build off of each other's innovation rapidly, and even though they may not have come up with it themselves, they can use this technology as a basis for their groundbreaking idea. The only thing we heard in response to that was, it's better if it's free, and second, that and we told you that obviously it's not going to be licensed because it will be trade secret. And then they realized that and retreated and said, oh no, licensing isn't profitable, so big companies don't do it in the first place. We told you quite clearly that Microsoft gets more money from licensing than it gets from Windows Phone. We told you how Qualcomm gets 75% of its revenue from licensing. That's simply a lie that they tried to peddle to you. Then we told you how large companies are simply better at innovation. They tried to take this as some sort of concession that they didn't have to rebut and said yes, that's why they don't need patents. And then we pointed out that, oh no, like they still basically <laughs> will disregard any kind of intellectual property and they'll basically keep it as a trade secret themselves. And again, they had no response to this. They again tried to just simply say that it's better for small companies to have this because small companies can take more risks, small companies can do better and once they have this policy. What they tried to do here was say, in the status quo, small companies don't innovate. In the status quo, patents exist. Therefore, when you remove patents, small companies will innovate. It simply doesn't follow from their side that small companies will innovate. The reasons we told you as to why small companies don't innovate right from our first speech still exist on their side. Like the fact that they don't have enough capital when the average startup has $500 million in capital, in total capital, whereas research can cost billions and billions of dollars even on their side. They also didn't rebut the idea that small companies can't get the best of the best for research. That's why they can't develop 5G and smartphone fingerprinting like they can on our side. Because they've completely failed to engage with our case. Because they've completely failed to rebut our solution because they haven't engaged with the real question in this debate. We've won this debate. Speaking time was four minutes, four minutes and four seconds. I would like to ask William to finish this debate and give the proposition's reply speech.
opposition challenged us to deal with two plot holes that were apparently evident in our case. The first is that reform is a much better alternative. The second is that companies won't reveal this information. Before I dive in and ask two questions as to which side should own, which side should, who should be allowed to own patents, and which side is better for innovation, let's deal with these two challenges. The first thing is, what are these alternatives going to look like and why are they going to be more effective? They have asserted that antitrust laws exist, that eminent domain exists, and that's going to be a much more preferable alternative to this one without telling us how that's going to be more effective. Comparatively, we told you that our policy is just a step further. It's a step further that we'd much rather have a blanket policy in which these companies can't access these patents because, surprise, surprise, a patent is a legally enforceable mechanism that makes it much easier for you as a company to entrench your monopoly, such that even in the face of antitrust laws, even in the face of eminent domain, which is status quo, we still see companies like Google and Facebook amass huge amounts of patents and become anti-competitive. But secondly, they said that these companies won't have an incentive to release information and are going to do things like have trade secrets. I'm going to show you later why that isn't the case. But in a system in which they don't have a legal mechanism to entrench monopolies, we say that their alternatives are actually more effective on our side. So we can use antitrust laws to curb on companies using trade secrets. But importantly, they can't prevent another company from using the same idea because it's not a legal mechanism. So if a small company comes up with the same idea that's protected by a trade secret, they can still trade with it, which is the difference in the status quo that we're proposing. Two questions, why should people be allowed to, which people should be allowed to own patents, and which side leads to better innovation? The first thing we told you on the first flash is that these big companies don't require patents to innovate because they already have the tools which allow them to innovate safely. They have things such as shareholders who put pressure on them to innovate. They have things such as trying to maintain their brand value. They have things such as captive markets which are expecting innovative products, things that they didn't respond to. This means that not only the incentive to innovate exists, but that secondly, they don't require a patent to protect their innovation. Who do we compare this to? We compare this to small companies that need who don't have that capital, who don't have those captive markets, who are taking higher risks. These are vulnerable actors that need the protection from a patent to be able to do this. The second thing they told us here is that these big companies need licensing to create profit. Now, this is a major concession, right? Because if Microsoft is making most of its money by licensing its patents to other people and isn't using those patents to meaningfully innovate, then we think that they don't deserve those patents to begin with. This is one way in which we think the corrosive patent culture has led to big companies sitting on patents, not using them for innovation, and then excluding small companies who want to do things like radically innovate to provide for society. We think that is a harm that is actually works to our side. But thirdly, right, we say that we don't allow these patents to big companies. We don't think licensing becomes a problem on our side because the information is freely available and you don't have to pay to access it. That encourages more innovation. Second question, which side leads to better innovation? They just asserted that these big companies are not going to have an incentive to innovate and are just going to retreat to not releasing innovation. We've already given you reasons for why that's not true, but we say that firstly, there's a first mover's incentive, that you as a big company want to go into the market first so that you can prevent another company from emulating your same product. But secondly, that if you don't do that, there is a potential that a small company is going to patent that product and you as a big company will also be excluded from trading that product. Those are real incentives that exist for these companies that we think means that they're still going to innovate along with all those other reasons. The second clash then becomes which side is better for innovation. They just asserted that small companies are incompetent in innovation. We exist that that might be the case now, right? Because they face huge barriers to entries, such as patents. Patents which make it difficult for them to litigate, difficult for them to navigate the patent thicket, which sees them uh, failing as small startups because of these barriers to entries. But once we remove them, we think they're more likely to innovate freely. And in an instance in which they can't innovate, they can sell themselves off to a big company and be used meaningfully by those big companies, as opposed to just being used for their patents. They also didn't respond to my entire point of stats and match, which show you why we get better products to the market. Ladies and gentlemen, because we need to better innovation and protection of crops and protection. <laughs>